Welcome to Sacred Sundays. I know we just asked who has been here before and who's here for the first time. So welcome if you're here again and welcome if you're here for the first time. I am Aura Nadrich, for those of you that don't know me, and I host Sacred Sundays once a month with pretty special people that are doing some wonderful work on the planet. They are true thought leaders and shapeshifters, and I am so looking forward to speaking with my two very lovely guests, Lauren Roche and Camille Marine. and welcome to Sacred Sundays, both of you. Thank you, Aura. It's a pleasure. Yeah, Total pleasure I know. Here. It's so great to have you. So let me tell you about these two wonderful people who are doing some great work and have some amazing books out that I have had the good fortune of. There's one that's not here. I literally had a sandwich of your three books on my bed. <laughs> I had um, Meditation Secrets for Women, which I told Camille I had um, brought this book to my women's group that I had for several years, and the women just lapped it up, loved it so much. This is a great book, ladies, and men. Maybe men to get to know ladies better. So this is a win book, fabulous. And the Radiant Sutras, which is going to be in my bio. I'm going to repeat this again. And then your third book, I don't see it. The uh, Meditation Made Easy, right? Okay. Yes. Anyway, let me, let me tell you just in order about Lauren and Camille. Lauren Roche and Camille Marine are married. How long? We've been together 35 years. Wow. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Not married all that time, though. Okay. She, she wanted to, like, check it out, <laughs> me out for about nine, uh -huh. about nine years or so. I'm not going to rush into this thing. Like, yeah. yeah, I'm not going to rush into things. Sorry, did you just add the nine years to how long you've been together? The nine years that you were checking him out? Is that Well, included? it's part of the 35. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so they are married and together have more than 50 years of experience teaching. Each. 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 50 years. I'm 45 years teaching. 45 years. You're. <laughs> so it's 50 years. Let me years. tell me with this so map. Okay. So it's almost 100 years <laughs> somehow between us of experience teaching. <laughs> okay, so to forget the 50, between them they have 100 years of experience. Yeah, about 100 years. Yeah. Teach. How is that possible? <laughs> I don't you said it, not me. I know. Right, so, <laughs> teaching meditation, Lauren has developed an approach he calls instinctive meditation, which works with each person's uniqueness from the inside out. There that's the way to do it from the inside out, right? There's no yeah. other way. Yeah, I mean, I mean, isn't that what meditation is supposed to be? Our <laughs> right. accessing our internal guidance? Absolutely. Um, you've written several popular books, which I just mentioned. Um, the Radiant Sutras, Meditation Made Easy, and again, Meditation Secrets for Women that you two wrote together. And yes. I want to hear about that because that's so cool that you wrote this book called Meditation Secrets for Women that you wrote with your husband. Yeah. That's very cool. Well, it's and actually I, his idea even. Okay, because I read in the introduction how you were having a conversation and from there is how this all came to be. So we're going to talk about that. You also have audio programs that include meditation for yoga lovers, and Camille also teaches movement, which we're going to be seeing tonight, dance, yoga, and improvisational theater. So please welcome Lauren and Camille to Sacred Sundays. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being present with us. Yeah, so we're going to do something a little bit impromptu, which I'm really going to take the lead um, from you two, because I know that there's going to be something that you're going to do that you're going to take me on this journey too, along with everybody else that, you know, from the Radiant Sutras, is that correct? Yeah. That you do. So why don't you explain that and we can just move into that so beautifully. 
So in 1968, I was working my way through college down at UC Irvine. Does everyone know where Irvine is? is it, what is it, 45, 50 miles south of here? And I'd, I'd been mowing the greens at Irvine Coast Country Club. It was actually a great job. You get up like at four in the morning and you have to have all 18 holes groomed before the golfers come in. So you really, you have to have all the first nine of the holes done by first light because as soon as there's a little bit of light, the golfers come out. You have to stay ahead of them. And um, at the university, UC Irvine was kind of new and they were, they were desperate for research subjects. So they made it a rule that when you're a social science major, you had to be in experiments and they paid you. They paid better money than I was making on the golf course. So one day I was sitting in class and this graduate student comes around and signs people up to be in a brainwave experiment. And that sounded really interesting. So I signed up on the clipboard for a couple afternoons later. And I go in and I'm a control subject. So they put me in a pitch black, completely silent room, just absolutely silent and absolutely dark. There wasn't a spot of light anywhere. And they had wired me up. They glued electrodes all over my head. And I was sitting back in this overstuffed chair. And the guy just said, I'll be back in a couple hours. Closed the door and just left me there with no instructions, nothing, because I was a control subject. And it was 1968, and I don't think I had heard the word meditation. In 68, you, it wasn't just everywhere like it is now. So I, just, I sat there for maybe half an hour, just in the pitch black. And then after a while, my mind just melted into the black silence. It became like an ocean of peace. I never experienced anything quite that intense. And this was the first session. And so it was in all almost three hours. And towards the end of it, the, the graduate student running the EEG machine, the brainwave machine, he said, okay, I've got enough data. And I remember saying, I think you better give me a few minutes. Because I was... <laughs> I had been merged with the blackness and silence. Was just com I was completely dissolved, I was awake, and space seemed so friendly. Infinity, you could call it the void, it seemed so friendly and it was so liberating. There was a sense of complete freedom and with my body, at the center of a large sphere of pulsating silent aliveness. And so I remember sort of condensing back and being able to move. And then I walked outside and the world was just brand new. And I've, I'd never taken drugs of any kind. And um, I had seen people taking drugs and sort of destroying themselves. So I wasn't interested. I wasn't exposed to any psychedelic language. You'd never had, Lauren, any altered state of consciousness prior? No, except what surfers do. I'd grown up surfing and sailing and skiing. So there are sports. In, in sports, you, you experience a complete immersion in nature, like surfing all day for hours and hours and hours. You're just, you're being clobbered by waves, you're diving under waves, you're rat, you're, all of those sports, especially water sports, you get completely immersed. But I hadn't been exposed to anything like that. It was 1968 and I was 18. And the world was luminous when I came out. 
and people glowed with aliveness. And this is something I had never experienced or heard of. And the experiment went on for the better part of a month. Every day in the afternoon, I would go into the lab and sit there in pitch black and wired up and just be there in the silence and darkness. And I got a job in the lab after the experiment ended. They needed more research assistance and they had money to pay and I needed a job. So I went to work in the lab and after a couple of weeks, there was a woman graduate student who had just come back from a silent retreat and they had been using the first English translation of this text, the Vijnana Bhairava. And they had been in silence, like eating in silence and walking in silence. And she read a couple of lines from the first English translation. And I immediately recognized it. Whoever wrote that, whoever composed that, knew the experience that I had in the darkness and silence. They knew whatever that is, where you, you dissolve, and then when you come back, the world looks brand new. And so I immediately jumped in my Volkswagen bug and drove to the bookstore. It was in, near the country club, near the golf course. It was a fashion island down there. And bought this little book, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, which in the back of the book, there's this 14-page section called Centering, which is the first translation of this text, the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, which was, appears to have been composed in Sanskrit around 800 AD in an area called Kashmir, up in the northern India, between India and Pakistan. And it was a center, like a renaissance center of where all the greatest yoga teachings came together. And there was a while there where this was a, there was a blossoming of meditative genius. And the text describes 112 different doorways into meditative states. And it presents meditation as a way of accessing the ecstasy that's always right here. The, the text uses the term doorway more than words like meditation because it just, you just enter. It's like you just touch the door and it swings open. And there you are in your inner world. There you are experiencing the sacred mystery that's always right here and that we long for. So here's what the text sounds like in the original Sanskrit. And Camille and I will sort of let the, let the Sanskrit hit us and, and rock us and shock us, <laughs> as it always does. These, the text comes as like a formal chant in Sanskrit and then it was written down so we might see it in, in writing. But the actual text lives in being sung and heard and also being performed, being brought to life. So what we're gonna do is I'll chant a couple of lines from the Sanskrit text a couple of times in different ways. And then Camille will bring it alive. Do you want to add anything to that? I would, yes. Uh, what you've said and what, of course, rings my bell is that it appears to, it is set up as a conversation between Devi and Bhairava or Sh 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 Shakti and Shiva, in other words, the divine feminine and the divine masculine and that it may even have been composed by an actual man and a woman I'm together. pretty sure that the text was composed 
by a woman and a man who lived together and practiced these techniques. Because it's, it's so life-affirming, so sensuous, so much about our everyday experience as the portal into expanded uh, perception and encountering the, the self. In fact, Bhairava, part of the aspect of Bhairava is the terror and joy of encountering the self. So it has, you know, it's not like all sweetness and light. It has rich depth and all kinds of tonalities to and it. Earthy. Earthy wisdom. Earthy wisdom, everyday wisdom. So, you know, for, for you get the feeling that it's designed for people who uh, are engaged. I mean, it's very appropriate for us in the 21st century as our, you know, our basic approach, where it's the life of engagement rather than the life of en renunciation. I also and just want to intimacy. add to that, Camille, that because I just became acquainted with it, and I was so struck by that immediately when I started to read it, even the, from the onset, the first verse. And, you know, with all of the understanding of mindfulness today and how we're becoming more aware of that, the communication is so beautiful. Mm. Do you know, the, the discourse between the male and the female, Shiva Shakti, is you just feel it immediately, you know, just from that first verse. So it really struck me when I began to read it that oh, it was beautiful. just so beautiful. So. Wonderful. And that uh, the other um, rich aspect of it is when we give body to it, like I'm going to give body to the English of the... Uh, translation that Lauren has done, that version, that in embodying uh, and in the dance between Shiva and Shakti, that their favorite place of dwelling is in the human heart. And in each of us, the interplay of awareness and energy and, uh, you know, this embodied, this em embodied understanding, this embodied wisdom. So as uh, when I do it, for example, I feel like I'm standing in for that part. I'm just joining with that aspect that is alive in all of us. So we'd love for you to do that. <laughs> yeah, let's. I'm just right. saying, you know, I'm going to use your microphone. After you this. are. I am, because it's long. Yeah, but it's mine. Do you want to use your? You don't, we can take this off. We've, we've already discussed. My <laughs> microphone. Okay. No, yeah. we can pass it back and forth. It'll be easier. So here's, here's what the text sounds like. This is Shutam Deva Maya Sarvam Rudra Yamala Sambhavam Tri ka veda ase shina sarat sara vibhagasha adya pina nivretome samshaya parameshvara kim rupam Tatvato Deva Shabda Rashi Kalamayam Kim Va Navatma Bedena Bhairave Bhairava Krito which is to say Beloved, it. 
Beloved and radiant Lord of the space before birth, revealer of essence, slayer of the ignorance that binds You who in play have created this universe and permeated all forms with never-ending truth. Beloved, I have been wondering. I have been listening to the hymns of creation, been enchanted by their verses, yet still I am curious. What is this delight-filled universe into which we find ourselves born? What is this mysterious awareness? This mysterious awareness permeating, shimmering, shimmering everywhere. Awareness shimmering, shimmering everywhere. Ah, I've been listening to the love songs of form, longing for formless. What are these energies? What are these undulating, undulating energies pulsing us into action? And this matter, this matter out of which our forms are made. What are these dancing particles? What are these dancing particles of condensed radiance? What is this play of flesh and breath? What is this power? What is this power? What is this power we call life? Hmm, beloved? So Shiva couldn't resist that. Though in the language, there's lots of puns and little love play and teasing. And Sanskrit is engineered so that one word will have five or 10, sometimes 15 meanings. It might be a, an, one word might be an asana, like a position in yoga, a position in sex, a kind of food, maybe, and something to do with making an intoxicating liquor, and then a, a spiritual state. So in the goddess's statements of wonder, she's using the words, each word has a multiplicity of meanings that allude to the myths and, and legends. And Shiva answers her 
by saying, beloved, the questions that you are asking can only be answered by direct living experience. And the experience is right here inside of every breath, such as the breath you're breathing right now. And so the practices, the 112 different doorways into the ecstasy that's always here begins with the breath and then runs through a bunch of classical yoga practices, but with a, a more grounded sensibility to the description. And then it gets wild and says, well, you could use any of these sacred mantras, you could use any of these special breathing techniques, or you could just look at the wall, or you could notice what are you daydreaming about and meditate with that. And then he goes into the yoga of music and listening to individual notes, listening to chord structures, listening to the overall impact as if of a band or an orchestra, and then following the music from the pulsating level where it's moving airwaves outside into the subtle internal experience where the music vibrates us inside and then into levels that are beyond sound where we're just pulsating. We just know the pulsation. And then into the vibratory space beneath sound. It's not quite silence. It's just a pulsating life force. And it goes on and on describing practices for rocking out to music and then getting into the undulation of the spine, what's happening in the spine when we're moving or sitting still. And what are these spaces in the body that we know? What are the spaces in us that pulsate when we're in love? And then on into practices that feel more like being at a party, practices with food, with lovemaking, with remembering lovemaking, and on it wandering in the wilderness. So he describes technique after technique after technique in this way. Maybe, maybe Sutra 26, go ahead, Camille. Well, um, <clears throat> you started working on a new version, when was it, like 30 years ago or something? When I finished my PhD, the sort of light bulb went off. I did, it, I did my PhD at UC Irvine on the language of meditative experience. And I spent eight years interviewing meditators of all kinds, everybody that I could find. Self-taught meditators, Zen practitioners, Catholics, Christian scientists, Vipassana people, mindfulness people of all kinds, all kinds of Buddhists, all kinds of yogi meditators. And when I finished this sort of light bulb went up, hey Lauren, why don't you do a fresh version of the Bhairava Tantra? And I said, of course, as we always do, like who me? Like aren't there thousands of people more qualified than me? But the thought kept coming back. And so in 1987, which is soon after finishing my PhD, I started to work on a fresh version. And I was actually at Esalen, if you know where Esalen is, it's up in Big Sur. And I had been teaching a workshop up there for a month long workshop. And I was sitting in the lodge at seven in the morning. I was the only person there working on, on the text, beginning to decode the Sanskrit. So there I am in, in this, the lodge, which is maybe, maybe a little bit smaller than this building. It's just the eating area at Esalen. So there's no one else in the whole place. And these two monks come sweeping in 
it's just a little after seven in the morning, maybe smelling faintly of frankincense, because they had just done a mass. And one sits right next to me, and the other guy sits across from me. And this guy looks over, this monk, he, he looks over at my notebook, and I was writing with a fountain pen on parchment paper. I had, I had found these blank books that have parchment paper. He looks right over and says, what are you doing? What are you writing? And I explained to him, and he literally, this is what he said. He said, I'm Father Matus, and I wrote a paper about the Vinyana by Rafatantra. He said, I feel like it was the inspiration for the early desert fathers in developing the Christian monastic tradition. <laughs> There's a lot of coincidences like that. A lot of allies like that have, had have come sailing along. And these things, when they happen, you know, they happen so casually that you don't necessarily realize that this is hair-raising magic at the time. So it wound up taking about 27 years to, of immersion in the text because what I'll do is I'll live inside the chant so that the chant is like is fizzing in my blood like um, to use that term from Joni Mitchell like holy wine it's a kind of a champagne quality to the Sanskrit maybe you felt it a little bit and simultaneously I'll have all these Sanskrit dictionaries and and technical academic tools and be savoring the meaning of each word and each phrase and the way that it's used in the yogic literature. So, so it's, been, it's been, uh, it's been uh, quite an extraordinary process to be with uh, Lauren and participate with him and enter that world through these years and then you know, just getting back to how we would even write Meditation Secrets for Women together. Right, yes. I mean, all of this just to me, when I familiarized myself with your material, it was all based in love. Yeah. I mean, it just, it was, it was all about love and acceptance and all of the non-judgment of self. It just, all of your work just seamlessly moves into that. It, there's a flow. I felt an overall flow. And very interesting to look at the way in which you took meditation, which is not like anything I've seen, really, and brought it into a, a, this sort of, wonderful um, just acceptance of self and non-self do you know in in and the movement of which seeing you just now it's just it has this beautiful free flow same with the meditation and the teaching of meditation it has it's there's no boundaries there's no limits there's no structure there's no expectation and that I found that very refreshing because now with all of the the new teachings of meditations, which really are old teachings, new teachings, current, old, whatever the time continuum is of meditation, is that it seems a little bit more structured lately, if you will. You know, there's there's this movement towards um, mm. the learning tends to be very structured, and this is not. Your work is very um, the discovery of from within and whatever that means for the individual meditator. Yeah, we like to start with discovering your internal structure rather than impose. What happens very often if you try to impose a structure on someone's meditation, it's the wrong structure. It's like if you're going into a shoe store and you don't know how a shoe is supposed to fit, so putting on the wrong size shoe, if you don't know, the shoe doesn't fit. Right. You'll, you might wear it and it'll make your foot bleed or maybe even crack, break your toes. Right. When, when people are learning to meditate, they don't know when the technique totally does not fit them. They'll right. try to make it fit, but in trying to conform to some, quote, standard meditation instruction, you can do the equivalent to your inner life of making your toenails fall off and get infected by wearing the wrong size. And not know shoe. that till 
not you know, knowing. Yeah, not know it's, it, and then feel right. the the expectation. I know, as a mindfulness, a meditation teacher, that there is this uh, hearing a lot of, "Am I doing it right? Should I be stopping my thinking?" You know, there's a lot of what people feel, and they don't even articulate it, but they're feeling it. And feeling like a failure because exactly. it's not matching their individual nature. But that, imagine feeling like a failure or the judgment of something that is so naturally called yeah. the breath. Just being with the breath. Do you know how, mm. how far that's gone from just being able to, you know, you describe what you experienced in the oneness in the dark and feeling as though you just disappeared into the numinous, which is the way I got what you described. And yet, how can one have an expectation of how you're supposed to experience something like that mm -hmm. when it's just this incredible awakening? Is there an instruction to awakening? Well, when, when I was doing my PhD research, I spent years interviewing meditators of all kinds and people, just searching out people and advertising, come in and, and talk. And what people taught me was that everybody has a natural genius at meditation. Like people are naturally good at meditating. And the, the structure of the interviews is very simple. Um, people would come in, and I would allow two hours at least. And I would take notes, but in, unobtrusively. And I would just say, well, tell me about your natural meditative states. And then I would phrase it in several different ways. When have you felt most at home in the world? When do you feel completely thrilled to be alive? And so people would, with that loose structure, would say, well, you know, holding the baby mm. Mm -hmm. and just looking in the baby's eyes, feeding the baby, and then when the baby's asleep, staying there, to let the baby fall deep asleep before putting her in her crib. Like, that state, I dissolved into love. Like, I felt so at home, so perfect. It was just the most perfect moment of all. So I would let the person teach me. Because when you, when you uh, listen to someone tell you about a state like that, they'll enter the reality of it fully. Like, they're, they're there. The invisible, the aura of the baby is there. They're in that state of love. And if you allow it, they'll be the teacher. You'll go there with them. Or listening to music. You know, it's two in the morning, and we've been dancing for six hours, and inside my body, it, they're just sparkles of light. I just feel like a field of sparkling energy. Or walking in nature. We walked, we walked for six hours up, up a hill, and then I sat down and looked out over the horizon. Or coming up, coming up for air, having dived under a 12-foot wave, and just coming up for air and breathing the air like the oxygen is the greatest, the most incredible elixir of all time. I, just, I spent thousands of hours listening to meditators of all kind, and I found that everybody that I had ever talked with has some gateway. They've experienced some of the gateways. And I'm, I'm always learning more. Like I have a friend who's a, a gambler. He plays poker for hours and hours and hours. And I had completely like ignored that side of things. But the states that they go into playing poker mm -hmm. for hours and hours is deep. To concentration. Deep rapture. Yeah. yeah. Deep concentration. So I'm always learning about new states that people have ex developed that are gateways into um, like deeper contact with Would life. Would you say then, I mean, I, I see it that every waking moment is a meditation. I mean, what isn't a meditation? 
you can yeah. talk about what is a meditation. For me, it's, well, what isn't a meditation? Yes, if you ask it that way, you there's know? only one answer. <laughs> well, it's sort of isn't, like saying... Isn't it all a meditation? It's sort of like saying human beings love to walk. Like, we have feet, and we love to walk. And, and people have been wearing shoes that don't fit or they tie their shoelaces together and so they're hobbled. What we like to do is let people be naturally good at meditation and we build the practice around their individuality. When you meditate in a way that's natural for you, it's a relief. It's not a discipline. It's, right. It feels like a sinful indulgence. Yeah, it yeah. feels good. It just it feels, feels good. good. How do you qualify feeling good? Yeah. Do you know how do you label it? How do you you just you just feel it? It feels good because it's like you're coming home to your own essence. Right. You're coming home to yourself. Right. And it's uh, it's so deeply integrating. This approach, you know, this has a lot of somatic wisdom and psychological wisdom folded in. Um. And so, yes, it's a lot about uh, freeing people from the misconceptions. Right, and, and supporting, I think... And uh, supporting that more Yes, in, and it always harkens movement. back to children for me because that's who we, we came in as. We would play and we would censor and we would roll around in the grass and we would laugh and we would be so in the moment and we've moved away from that. Well, actually, um, a recent revelation uh, the last few years that I've been talking about is that everything that we are experiencing, all of our, there's a sort of a dissing about thoughts and busy minds. Well, what if everything that we are thinking about, everything, uh, all of the intense emotions, all of the body sensations, but mm -hmm. our memories or our fantasies or our rehearsing of something, our worries, our anxieties are all because of our love. They arise from the movement of love, of being engaged, of daring this brave adventure of being human in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a complete reframe of all of that language about um, what you do with your thoughts. Well, rather to savor them and to realize that the, your whole body, your whole body, your brain, this marvelous instrument that is making connections and re, uh, recreating its map of the world continually has to happen. That has to happen. You don't want to suppress that. No, not at all. You don't want to suppress any of it. Yeah. I mean, I do something called the says who meditation where I, I, inv I say invite the thoughts, welcome them. You yeah. know, not They're miracles. Yeah, don't push them away. Don't thwart them. Don't suppress them. Really celebrate the thoughts, yeah. do you know? And then you can really rejoice in them and not yeah. judge them. And the core, the sort of complement to that is what do I do when my experience is so intense? You know, when, when life itself is giving us very intense situations or what is arising is very intense and that's a whole uh, other layer of what do I do with the intensity of being alive? Right. With the intensity of my love? How can I support myself really for what, I, what matters to me? And that I, you know, that my heart is brimming with with experience and brimming with the, the longing to give what I have to offer to this world and also to, to more deeply uh, receive, which requires a letting go, which is a big process. Yes, the letting go is, I think that the holding on, which becomes constrictive, and I think that's when we almost freeze in that. Yeah. And that even if we can become fluid and let that thought just be released, then we start to feel that in the flow of the body again. Yes, and bring great tenderness to whatever that place in us is. Right. Great tenderness. So I, I really love that. I want you to just know that that was so uh, lovely in the meditation books because I think again now it's something that would be very timely to mm. speak of 
because of this, there's a wonderful movement with meditation. I started meditating over 40 years ago and I learned through TM, which taught me how to be a disciplined meditator. So I'm thankful for that. And then really wanted to morph into new ways of expressing and experiencing meditation. What I'm seeing with the new movement of meditation, more people wanting to learn meditation, I think it's important to really introduce the idea of the non-attachment to a particular style, a particular way, a particular lineage, you know, there, and then not to get stuck in that, that the way you've introduced it is from within and to find your own comfort level, your own truth around your meditation. What is that for you? Yeah, just having one particular practice can be like just eating one food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Right. Like it could be great food, brown rice or salad or papayas right. or wheat. We once <laughs> met this guy that is li he claimed to be living just on avocados, that they're the perfect food because they have protein and fat. Um, but it gets a little boring after a while, and there's actually no reason to not spice it up because we need other minerals and we actually our cravings actually guide us right like when we're dehydrated we feel thirsty our cravings are originally designed to um make us want to eat a mm. variety of things mm. and I, I found that people have good instincts in meditation not only are people naturally good at meditation if you let them meditate in a style that matches their nature. But they actually, people have good instincts. Mm. And um, like in my early 20s, I was a know-it-all meditation teacher, which that kind <laughs> of arrogance. Well, young men are, I think, supposed to be arrogant. And it's fun when you're 22. You know, like to feel like I have all the answers. I know everything. Just do what I say. <laughs> um, but when I learned to listen to people, and it takes a while, like, uh, like a two hours, people deserve a, a leisurely two hour session where the teacher is just saying, tell me about your natural meditative states. When do you feel at home in the world? When do you feel thrilled to be alive? And let the student teach the teacher about their inner path, their inner doorways. Right. It's profound experience. Um, I've spent much of my life doing this, really. It's been 50 years. And it's one of the greatest things ever. It's an honor when people start opening, sharing their most favorite, special experiences. You learn infinitely valuable things. Yes. And everybody, right. everybody has things like this. Camille and I walked into a, a sizzler type of restaurant. It was like a steak and thing. We were up in Reno, Nevada. And it was just like what was available. And this guy in a suit, big burly guy in a suit comes over. Like it takes a lot of beer to be that big. Big guy in a suit comes over all friendly kind of football player, it's like, hey, how are you doing? What do you want? How come you? And he's the manager, clearly, not a waiter. And he's just a glow. So I said, he came back the second time, and I said, you look like a meditator. I said, you look like, <laughs> I said, you're a glow with something. What do you do that lights you up in that way? And he went on and on about fly fishing. He said, well, it's a time of year. I wait all year. For it, you know, the, I know these places in the mountains where I walk up for three hours, and I stand there in a stream in, in my boots, stand there just doing this motion for hours. And, you know, he show, he's showing me the motion, and and I said, "Well, what are you seeing? What are you hearing?" He goes, "You know, I hear there's this roar, there's a ripple of the stream, there's a sound of the stream, and I'm yeah. in it." And I feel occasionally the ripples through my boots. Yes. And then the light's changing. And I'll see the light glinting, sparkling on the water. And I'm just there. I'm there in broad peripheral vision watching for ripples of the fish. 
I'm just doing this thing. And he says, I'm so happy. He says, a lot of times I put the fish back. I'll, t- I'll take a couple. But I just stay there fishing and I put the fish back very carefully not to injure them. And he said, you know, I'll stay there till late in the afternoon and then I hike back down. And it, I mean, that for him is profound meditation. He's in communion. He's, mm-hmm. It was a state of rapture. When he was describing it, he was shining like the sun. This was communion. And it was instinctive. And, and anybody that, if anyone says that's not meditation, like I, I don't want to know anything more about <laughs> yes. that, whoever, can, that exactly. a, whoever that authority is. Right. They're so ignorant. This man was a glow. And everybody has experiences like that. People on their knees in their garden, people, musicians, playing their instruments, that, artists. That question, Lauren, is so lovely that you asked him because I remember when I read, I think it was Dr. Bernie Siegel's book many, 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 many years ago. And I think when he recognized that he didn't just want to be a doctor that was giving people their death sentence mm. as an oncologist and that went into connecting with people to find out what is their peace? Mm. What is their bliss? And so many people couldn't connect to that or even name it. So what we're talking about really is something in all of our lives where we are so connected to the divine, whether it's fly fishing or gardening or hiking or cooking or dancing or listening to music, you know, we need to do more of that in our lives. And you recognize it oftentimes when that disconnection happens, which is what he discovered as a doctor, that it, it was about connecting to that place in you that does make you feel whole. That is where wellness lives. Mm, beautiful. Do yes, you know? and if people connect with that first, in, in the description, they'll actually start to sound like one of the 112 su- sutras. They'll actually start to describe what sounds like one of these 112 classical meditation practices. And then they practice that. So when they, you build, if you build the person's meditation practice on their natural love of life, then they're ahead of the game right from the beginning. If you don't do that, it might even be a good technique, but it's like an imposition. It's like a cage being imposed from above, and then people are struggling to get out and feeling bad mm-hmm. about it. There's around the world that so many people have a sense of failure about meditation. I agree with you. I, I, I've actually, not to um, dumb it down per se, but I find myself taking that word out of the equation. And I say, for somebody who's never meditated, and I ask them to just close their eyes and taking, take, take a few breaths and connect to your breath. And what does that feel like? And they go, hmm, yeah, that feels good. You know, you start to just, and then basically guide them into feeling that relaxation and connecting to the breath and feeling the warmth of it or putting their hand on their heart and feeling the rising and the falling. And they've never meditated. And they say, oh, that felt really good. And I said, you were meditating. If you want to call it that. Do you know? You were living. You were breathing. You, I, I, I don't want to just be able to define that as meditation, but I think it gives people permission to connect to what is natural in them, yeah. which is the breath. Well, we're not doing people any favors by pretending to be structured and like, oh, yeah, I know what I'm doing. It's this very serious thing. It's a discipline. <laughs> and you've got to hunker down and do it. We're not doing people no. any favors because with these interior skills, there's no way to really give feedback. It's very subtle. Like with with your moving your hands, say you're playing piano, 
the piano teacher can watch you and say like you're holding your hands wrong. Like if, like say, I'm just making this up, I don't play piano, but say that someone was going like this at an awkward angle, the teacher could so you're crimping your wrist to get at those keys and that's gonna injure you over time. Mm. So you're gonna, you're gonna have to figure out how to do this or lean this way. Or, or with tennis or golf or singing. Right. Like singers, you know, are always injuring their voices. Like didn't Adele had to cancel a whole tour of That's England right. or something like yes. that because she had injured her voice. Like singers like to make these big sounds, but it's wear and tear on the vocal cords. Mm. And it, it, it's, it's always happening to singers. Mm -hmm. And they have voice coaches that, that train them. Well, meditation is these delicate internal skills and usually the meditation teachers have never had individual coaching. Yeah, that's a stunning thought. Like I have a friend who's an acupuncturist and he was, had a degree in acupuncture and had gone through years of training. And I was astonished we were at dinner. He was doing another year of advanced internship where he spent a year following his master teacher around in every session all day long every day just to get more training in welcoming each client, getting their pulse, checking them where to place needles, how to diagnose, how to treat that person as an individual because it's all about the individual. There aren't any meditation teachers on earth who have been through that or who have been through like a surgical internship where there's a group of master teachers and then there's these people coming in. You just spend years learning to suss out what's happening with that person and then coming up with an individual treatment. And this is why actually what we need actually is people that are like therapists, massage therapists, and there's all kinds of therapists like dance therapists and art therapists and speech therapists. We need all kinds of people coming and learning to teach meditation. People who are like kindergarten teachers, people who are used to reading an individual and finding out what works for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What Love other, yes. not so much psychiatrists because it's too much training in analyzing <laughs> and diagno and then pathology. Yes but dancers of all kinds, yes. massage therapists, art therapists, music therapists, who would let this person, like what turns you on? Because in the world of meditation, <laughs> there's a whole world of meditations with sexual energy. There's meditations with music, pick music that's so beautiful that you feel like you're gonna die. Yes. Like music that you could die into. Rapture. Yes. Rapture of music, yeah. go into that, all right, and then be there. How, what happens to your attention right. when you expose yourself to music that's so beautiful that you just, you, it's all like you die and go to heaven. <laughs> well, there's the mantra. We should start our day, what turns me on? Mm. That's it. What mm. else do we need to ask ourselves? What turns me on? And if we're going to ask that to one another, what turns you on? You know, if we come from that place. Yeah, and it's not, this is the real <laughs> discipline. I have friends who, and teachers who were like the monk in the cave, just got a loincloth and, you know, up there in the mountains in the cave. Right. And that's basically what they ask. Because they have access to the whole world of yoga. And if you look at the mantras of the world and the breathing practices, it's really what thrills me right now. Because all I have is this, my little cave and I have time to practice yoga. Right. It's what practice is a manif manifestation of me being in love with the life force. Right. I think we're going to open it up to some questions if anyone has any. There's more to share, more to talk about, more to explore. But if anybody has a question that they'd like to ask any of us, um, please do. Yes.
How beautiful. What a great phrase. I'm going to, I have to repeat the question because this is being filmed. So that was a juicy, long question, but if I could just sort of, it's what do you do with the thoughts, basically? Isn't that the question? There, with, in meditation, you feel that your thoughts pretty much frame the, the inner landscape. Was that correct? They, they help create structure to it so you can navigate them in the meditation. They, okay, so we got that. All right. You want to answer that? What a great perception. I've never heard anyone frame it quite that way. And it shows the profound difference between meditation for monks and nuns. Who, these are people who have given up their life, maybe shaved their head, changed their name, gave away everything their own, maybe taken a vow to never see their family again, people who have disconnected, and people who live in the world where... Our thoughts are par packages of intelligence. It's part of our internal guidance system. It's exactly. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. Because on the path of intimacy, it's what we could call the, this path where we're not being monks and nuns and we're not practicing disconnection. We're practicing connection and we need every ounce of intelligence that we have. We do. We need every ounce of intelligence we have to navigate through this world because we're all as if billionaires. We are. Just to be here, this is a gift, a privilege that was given to us by all of human history. We all have supercomputers in our pockets. We could access the world's libraries in a few seconds. We could look at, we could look at a, a, a cam, a video camera from almost anywhere on earth in a few seconds. We, we live in unbelievable privilege. Just to be middle class is an incredible privilege. Just to have teeth. In the past, people didn't even have teeth. All the teeth fell out and there was no medical care. So... But to navigate this world of incredible richness that we're all in, we need our thoughts. We need our intelligence. Each one is a package full of energy and intelligence. We don't necessarily, we don't act on all of our thoughts, but each one is a package of intelligence. So Camille, how would you add to that? Your, uh, your whole nervous system is, your, your awareness is traveling to, uh, to touch the things that matter to you. The things that are, the, the, the interactions, the uh, to-do lists, everything that, that makes up your life, your daily life of engagement. So that movement of thoughts, I love how you said it, which, you know, that it's providing the structure or the sort of landscape for you to go deeper, uh, makes perfect sense that because you're, you're orienting yourself, when you enter your inner world, it's not separate from the outer world. You're, you're everything that you care about is present with you and your thoughts are moving and actually different parts of the brain are communicating to each other. Places that, uh, that are being integrated, your experience is being integrated and you're also creating the space of awareness for something new to rise up to meet that. Now, if you were to try to suppress the movement of thought, or even like, just barely tolerate it, uh, that would uh, almost prevent that integrative process. This is an extremely miraculous, intelligent event, what we are. And to know that in, in instinctive wisdom, that innate intelligence, that creativity, that is our nature, in fact, is always at work with us. We want to cooperate with that. So it just, you know, thoughts, uh, maybe there's another word. Because there's such, you know, 
bad rap about thoughts in the meditative world, to, to feel that sense of the, in, the um, innate, organic, evolutionary, creative movement that everything that in your experience is, seeking integration, seeking healing, seeking a, a more elegant way of embodying and expressing, seeking ways of how can I tune, can I, how can I come into, into deeper tune with all my energies humming freely, fully, coming into that symphony so that I can enter back into the world resourceful and resilient. So you want, you want to allow that process. Now what you do want to do, perhaps, is join it. Join, give yourself that juicy something, that what turns you on, what you love. Something that you're called, you want to be drenched with, you want to be saturated in, you want to be bathed in, you want to be supported by, or some freedom of giving yourself more space. Something that gives you that that sacred space that you mentioned, that sanctuary in which this process is happening. So you're, you're coming to meet yourself on every level with that, that renewing, uh, vibrant, love-drenched quality of awareness. Very transformational. And so you're on, t you're on it. I'd like to it. also, I want to add something to that as well, that for me with meditation, I come to it allowing. I don't want to come to it expecting. So therefore, I'm allowing the thoughts to come as they so choose to come. And what I want to do with that experience is completely up to me. If I want to relax in a meditation, I, I don't want to instruct my thoughts to do something other than what they do, but I can help guide them through the breath, through my awareness, that starts to relax my thinking mind. And so therefore, relaxation, which is oftentimes what I want to experience, in a calming meditation, I'm able to achieve that with the creative process. If I want to experience a meditation to ignite creativity, then I want to allow for that as well. So I, I feel that I come to the meditation with an understanding of what it is that I would like to receive out of that experience. And just about that, I find that um, knowing how to receive from the forces of life, the body of love, right. is also a, a great permission that we benefit from. Right, I think this whole how to. notion of stopping, I hear the word stopping thoughts a lot when meditators have that expectation as opposed to the allowing and that that seems to be synonymous a lot of times to are you doing it right are you doing it wrong because the ongoing activity of the mind there's some kind of expectation that it should be otherwise do you know and I know Lauren you talked about that earlier as well this notion of stopping something that's like it's an unnatural process. It's like thwarting, you know, thwarting. It is thwarting. What the, actual, the actual standard expectation of what meditation is, not so much any particular teacher's instructions, but what we all think. It's sit still and shut up. <laughs> and stop, stop your thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's stop thoughts. It's actually a prescription for internal abuse. <laughs> and constipate emotional constipation. Love and that. It's a beatdown. <laughs> that is so, so good. When, I when, could you repeat that? That is so good. What you just said. It needs sure to be needs to that. be said. I was yeah. telling um, Camille. Yes, at, during the break, people really would benefit from hearing that, Lauren. They really would. Thanks. It's a. It's actually 
the formula for internal abuse. And so when you, and when you accept that instruction that you're supposed to sit still and try to shut up, it, you've, you're, in, you're installing what actually amounts to like a computer virus in your brain that's hijacking your natural intelligence. And you're internalizing the self-abuse, which is what people do when they're in an abusive family or children do when they're being sexually abused or, or physically abused in some way. You, in, you internalize that abuse and that shame. And this is not intended for people who live in the world. It's a mistake. Mm -hmm. This is a technique for monks and nuns that they go through where they consciously decide to die to the old self. That's what people do when they join a monastery, shave their head, have a new name, and they go through this sort of boot camp for years to destroy their old identity. They go through a process, it's almost like surgical amputation or injecting Botox into their brain to kill off the old self so that they don't hanker to go back that they're just completely there in the monastery or in the nunnery. Right, it's like a type this, of self-flagellation, self, yeah. like imposed restrictiveness, constrictiveness, yeah. and you know, it's a type of punishment. It's a, a type way. of punishment. Yeah. And there are people who thrive on punishment, but that's not everybody. There are people, I'm told, that go to like expensive prostitutes to be flogged. It's in the TV. You know, it's like hip to talk about it now. There, you go, there are people that can't have an orgasm unless they're being whipped or humiliated. There are people who have, it's called it, who have kinks like that. But and monk type people probably do have that. Like there was a, that movie in book, The Name of the Rose, mm -hmm. where Sean Connery is like a detective, and there's the monks flogging themselves. There are people like that, and it, it's from the monastic world in particular. But that's not something you should teach everybody in the name of meditation. As you it, said, you, you teach meditation for, for, you know, how did you describe it? Northern Americans. People who live in, in the world. <laughs> people who live in the world, yes, exactly. Just to live in the world. All over the world. All over the world, right. To, to live in the world, just do anything. Have a dog, have a cat have kids, have a job, do what you love, be a musician and compose a piece of music and try to get it published. Just following what you love will lead you into suffering. Building this building. Right. Just anything that you do, you're gonna run into innumerable obstacles and you're gonna be standing here at midnight <laughs> with something undone, paint drying, the electricity isn't on, the fuse blown, the guy who's supposed to do this thing didn't show up, whatever, the bank wants the payment, this thing didn't get delivered, the person who knows that didn't come, or they're late, or they had right. the cold. Or you're, you love a dog, and the dog becomes your soul buddy, and then after however long the dog lives, how long do dogs live? Seven years, nine years? 15 years, mm -hmm. then the dog gets old and dies. <sighs> but so anything yeah. great right. you, is going to involve unbelievable loving and losing. And so you don't need to go out no. and invent fake suffering. Exactly. There's plenty of it to go around. Why do Real you want life. Why do you want to double dip into the suffering? You don't want... You, <laughs> fake suffering like, will distract you from the total intensity of following what you love Experiencing the joy and experiencing the sorrow. But don't you think, let me just jump in and say, when you are choosing an ascetic path, if you are renouncing, if you're the, on the path of a monk or what that is, to reach enlightenment, to whatever it is, you know, these are, these are roads and paths and journeys that are selected for whatever reasons, and that's personal. I get that. It's knowing what is your path and not feeling that in order to beat yourself up, in order to punish yourself somehow, you will reach a higher level of consciousness. Yeah. Do you know? That is, that is one of the, um, the fantasies. And there's tremendous amount of self-torture 
in the religious traditions. That's part of the, the pathology of religious people. We all, we're the inheritors of priceless wisdom. Like we have in paperback the secret teachings of the whole world. There's the secret teachings of the Amazonian shaman, the, the secret teachings of the Mayan priests, you know, the secret teachings of the Tibetans, of everywhere, the Taoists. The Egyptians. The, hmm? the Egyptians. Egyptians. It's Celts. It's fabulous. It's as if you're a gardener <laughs> and great fertilizer from all over the world has been dumped. There's like a 50 foot high pile of some sort of fertilizer <laughs> and from all over the world and then seeds. It's a wealth and it's up to you to figure out how to mix it to grow stuff. We've received this wealth. I don't think anyone in the history of planet Earth has ever had access to the wealth that we do. It's our job to figure out how to use it well. Right. We cannot imitate the people of the past. We're, we may have been, by all the Asians believe in reincarnation. And if that's true, then we're them. If reincarnation is true, then you are that guy, that Taoist monk back in the mountains who invented Qigong. And now you're here and walking around Lincoln Boulevard in a female body. What do you want to do? What's your next invention? We, we have received this wealth greater than anyone in a history that we know about or could even imagine. And it's our job to figure out how to thrive in it. Right. And not to try and stop it and reinvent it and deny it. And no. It's just <laughs> why do we feel compelled that we have to mess with it? What is it about us that what feels we're doing that we have to do something to what we're doing change with it up? It's like trying to eat the bottle. <laughs> oh, we're that's trying good. to eat the wrapper, the protective wrapper that the teachings came in. The the monks and nuns to the were water just of life. They're just completely <laughs> wild ass people of the past. And in order to get by in society, they have to like put on airs like I am so holy. Yeah, you, got, you people are all so lucky to even catch a glimpse of me as I walk by. They had to put on airs. That was just what you do. If you think about Mardi Gras or Halloween, it's like here's the monk walking along, here's the nun. They've got their costume, they've got their game face on. You had to do that back in the day. But the fantasy that a monk or a nun is more spiritual, it's got to go. Mm. Like, if we just look at the world clairvoyantly, like, look at who's vibrating with life. It's like these teenagers endlessly practicing on their skateboards. Man, those people look like the most ultimate Zen monks. You know, these teenagers go out there <laughs> and they'll practice until it's dark. They're there for six, seven hours. They're practicing and they fall and they get up again and they fall and they get up again and they fall and they get up again, until they finally can just go like this and they, skate, they somehow make the skateboard flip underneath, underneath their feet and they land on it. Like that is, if anything is Zen, that's Zen. They're right. utterly in love with gravity and <laughs> space and motion and kinesthesia and balance. And they're and the surfers out here, just walk to, look at, at any beach and look at the surfers come in the, from the ocean. They're, they're ravished with love. Their auras are gl aglow with prana. Vitality so, and, and enthusiasm. Women, women, pregnant women, women with babies, lovers, dancers, all these people are aglow with love. And... In, we live a couple miles over in the marina. There's all these workmen. And so there's all these workmen in ditches. And those guys are amazing. So all over the place, there's people doing this incredible stuff. We work with musicians a lot. And I'm a particularly in awe of all musicians. Yes. They, they look normal, but if you sit with them, 
they can be there for six or eight hours. We were recording some songs yeah. from the Radiant Sutras. And these musicians would sit there from 11 in the morning until 1 in the morning. Mm. And they, I mean, they would barely go to the bathroom. Love they it. were so in the zone of just in love with sound and silence that they were just in a realm of mastery of meditation. Right. And they, would ne they don't think of themselves as masters. They just love music. Yeah, you're doing what you love. But this, the, holding yeah. total focus. Yes. I, Camille and I are, are there with them all the time. And their minds never wandered for 12 hours straight. Right. Just a little lunch break, a little dinner break. Right. They're yes. absolutely in the thing. So people all over the Rapture. place are in these realms. They're in these, finding their way into their zone of their passion. Mm. And we need to learn to respect that and not mm -hmm. think that there's people above us right. because we can't imitate anyone else. That's Meditation, an old paradigm. I think that we're moving a, into a new evolution yes. of consciousness. And these are old, I think, paradigms. I we would agree. Crusty, that, desiccated. Yeah, yeah, we gotta you know talk about letting go of old unsustainable ideas, right, and attachments to what we think we have to idolize, you know, to feel that we are worthy or alive. It feels very old to me. It feels very um, dinosaur ish, if you will. Do you know? So it's time to move yeah. out of that. Yes. The dinosaurs. And we but they're our dinosaurs, so we have to figure out how to live with these dinosaurs. Right. But not get, not let them step on us. Right, exactly. Or just become their food, because they will, <laughs> it, so to speak, that you will yes. become their food. You remember when I bust meditation, it's me, because I've been doing this since, I'm 68, I've been doing this since I was 18, it's been my whole world. So I've made all of the mistakes. Yeah, and, right. and survive, barely survived, but I had good coaches. And, and another thing is, um, in the past, well, they, would, they never asked, what do women need? What is a female body and psyche? Uh, what are her strengths? What, is, what, a, what does she require? What is her inner ecology? Uh, so honestly, that was why we wrote Meditation Secrets for Women, to, to uh, flesh that out and begin that conversation what I call our female energy ecology, which uh, a lot of men have been reading and getting something from it for themselves, so it's not exclusive, except for those biological differences that are so wonderful. Uh, but that, that it just never occurred to the monks and yogis of the past to ask about what a, what a woman would need. It just wasn't on the map until now. All right, I'm getting a signal that we are almost out of time. My goodness, yeah. that really... We got a cool time. That, that yeah. flew by. Oh, we have a three-minute uh, meditation. Okay, so let's do that. Let's do a three-minute just to feel the movement of that wave, to use your surfer analogy, you know, like not even call it a meditation. Why don't we just all join together and feel this beauty that is in this room. I feel it. Do you feel it? Yeah. Feels good. And as Lauren and Camille were saying, you know, it's about doing what turns you on and feeling that and allowing for that. So we end our evening with that beautiful feeling of acceptance of what is, whatever that is for us, whatever that means to you, whatever that free feeling, that open, expansive feeling is for you. What is that? And just let it be. Welcome it. 
Say yes to it. Open yourself up to it. To feel that love. To feel that creative surge of energy. To be so turned on to life that we are always open to it. And we say yes, yes life, I am here to receive you. And knowing how lucky we are to be alive in this very moment. room with myself and Camille and Lauren and all of us that held this space together to make it what it is, special, beautiful, meaningful. And may you leave here tonight holding that feeling in your heart of openness and expansiveness and yesness to the universe. And just be with us when you're feeling and at your own pace when you're ready. Just open your eyes or if they're already open stretch move yawn laugh whatever it is have your moment as beautiful you thank you